it gives me a great present my colleague, uh, Dr. Abrar Salama. She is a consultant in medical retina, and uh, she is going to talk to us about the expanded phenotype, phenotypic spectrum of enhanced Escon syndrome. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Bahabad, for the nice uh, introduction. So we'll start, Bismillah. Uh, I will talk about uh, enhanced Escon syndrome and the phenotypic spectrum of the disease. And I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Dr. Sosan Nuelati, for sharing her cases and her experience with me. So the purpose of my presentation today is to highlight the clinical features and spectrum of enhanced Escon syndrome to facilitate the recognition of this disease. And also I'll present some underrecognized features and phenotypes. So enhanced Escon syndrome is not uncommon in our region. It's an autosomal recessive retinal dystrophy characterized by hyperfunction of short wavelength cones, which is S or blue cones. Patients usually present with night blindness, lamellar pigmentary changes around the vascular arcades, arytenoschisis. So this is the fundus photo of one patient. This is the left eye, which shows pigmentary changes around the vascular arcade, very macular, which is evident on fundus autofluorescence. So it, it was first described by Goldman in 1957 and Favre in 1958. They reported two cases of hyaloid retinal degeneration. It was the first report of two siblings. And uh, this is the article in French. And then in 1990, Marmor and Jacobson, they noticed hypersensitivity of blue cones and they proposed the name enhanced Scone syndrome. And in 2000, Hader reported the fix in a nuclear receptor gene, which is NR2E3, are linked to the enhanced Scone syndrome. And this was uh, published in Nature Genetics. So enhanced Escon syndrome is caused by mutations in NR2E3, which is a transcription factor involved in photoreceptor differentiation, differentiation and plays an important role in the determination of photoreceptor cell fate. Mutation in NR2E3 lead to loss of function in the transcription factor, which alters the development of photoreceptors toward Escon's at the expense of other photoreceptor types. So in enhanced Escon syndrome, we have 92% of the cones are S-cones instead of the normal 10%. So the, the electrophysiology, the electrotonic gram is pathognomonic for enhanced s -cone syndrome. This is the normal ERG, and this is an ERG of a patient with enhanced s -cone syndrome. We can see an undetectable rod response and a widened and delayed rod cone response which is similar to the single flash cone response. So they have similar ERG waveforms under scotopic and photopic conditions. And also they have reduced 30 Hertz flicker amplitude, which is lower than that of the single flash cone A wave. So when you see this ERG, this is pathognomonic for enhanced Escon syndrome. They usually present with early onset night blindness, variable visual acuity loss, hyperopia is common, and in, in children, they can present with accommodative isotrope. So the fundus features, this is the main uh, part of my talk today, and uh, all the fundus photos, all photos that I will present are from our own patients, and all of them, they have genetic confirmation of an r 2 e mutation. So we have a high degree of variability. Usually the fundus features are fairly symmetrical and bilateral, as you can see here in the right and left eye on this photos of one patient, they are fairly symmetrical. They usually have normal optic disc and retinal arterioles. And the children with enhanced Escon syndrome may initially have a normal fundus appearance, but usually abnormal fundus autofluorescence, and later on they develop muscle RPE changes along the arcades. So the typical classic fundus features of enhanced Escon syndrome are the mid-peripheral pigmentary disturbances at the level of the RPE, coarse pigment clumping outside the temporal vascular arcades, and sometimes nasally and macular schisis of variable height 
and sometimes peripheral cases. And in some cases, you can see between retinal degeneration and other features. So I'll talk about each feature in details. Here we can see this photo shows the classic typical picture of enhanced scan syndrome with perimacular pigmentary changes and the macular schesis. So the first characteristic on this feature is the near peripheral nonular, nonular hyperpigmented clumps. So it is nonular, not like bone spicules, and it is deep. And it's usually around the vascular arcade, and it's variable in, num in num number and size. You can see here in the three photos, the size, the variation in size and in the number. Another classic fundus feature is the mid peripheral grainy hyper and hyperpigmentation, as we can see here. The grainy hypo and hyperpigmentation in the near periphery. And also here in the other two photos, it's, it's like a salt and pepper changes. Another interesting uh, and important feature is the yellow white dots. They are round and sharply demarcated, located in the nasal and inferior nasal uh, to the optic nerve head, and occasionally at the macular border. So these photos are from different patients. So we can see here the yellow white dots, nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head. We rarely see this finding in other conditions other than enhanced Scone syndrome. So another important and peculiar fundus feature is the comet-like lesion. This is a very nice descriptive term by Dr. Noelati. These are yellow white dots with characteristic short radial linear extensions located in the infranasal near periphery and occasionally at the temporal macular border. So we can see here the comments in infranasally. So many of these comments. And also here we can see it at the macular border. And here in this photo, we can see them here at the macular border. Another important feature also is the two bead-like lesions. They are well demarcated, round or oval through retinal atrophic or depigmented lesions with hyperpigmented margins and usually located in the near periphery. As we can see here, the hypopigmented at choreoretinal atrophic lesions with hyperpigmented margins. And here also we see the characteristic pigmentary changes of enhanced Scone syndrome. Another classic feature is the macular schesis. It can have variable height and extent. It can be discrete foveal schesis, broad shallow schesis, or high dome shaped schesis. It does not leak in fluorescein angiography and it can be associated with lamellar macular hole and sometimes full thickness macular hole. So this one, this photo shows macular schesis, which is evident on OCT as a broad shallow schesis. So the three forms of macular schesis, this is the discrete foveal schesis, which can barely seen clinically more evident on OCT. And this is the broad shallow schesis, as we can see here, and the high tone shaped schesis, which can be evicted on fundus photo and also clearly on OCT. Another classic fundus feature is the peripheral retinoschesis, with or without demarcated uh, border by heavy pigmented clumps. So this photo shows temporal peripheral retinoschesis demarcated at the border, border by deep pigmented clumps. And here also another peripheral retinoschesis with hyperpigmented border. This is also another nice picture of peripheral retinoschesis in nasal to the optic nerve head with deep pigmented clumps at the border all over the nasal part and the inferior nasal part. And you we can also see the comets here 
and the yellow white dots nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head and also subretinal fibrosis, which I'm going to talk about later. They can also have some degenerative vitreous changes like fibrillar strands and in some cases vitreous haze, as we can see in this photo. So another important but unrecognized feature is the retinochoroidal neovascularization. So in young, in young patients with retinochoroidal neovascularization and night blindness enhanced skin syndrome should be considered. It's seen in patients as young as two years. We have seen it in 15% of our enhanced skin syndrome patients. It's almost, almost always located in the central macula except in two eyes of one patient in our series. Compatible with type 3 neovascularization or retina adjumatous perforation. And eyes with RCN are more likely to lose vision compared with those without retinochoroidal neovascularization. So, this one on this photo shows the retinochoroidal neovascularization with the dipping arteriole and venule with pigment on its surface. And on OCT, we can see it as a compact hyperreflective lesion surrounded by macular species. So it can present unilaterally or bilaterally, generally in symmetric locations. And the active stage, we can see retinal venous congestion. And usually, the RCN evolves into a localized unifocal fibrotic nodule with a pigmented spot on the surface and dipping retinal vessels into the lesion. And can present de novo as active lesions, which then evolve into the characteristic unifocal fibrotic nodule. So we can see here the RCN lesion, which is fibrosed and some pigment over its surface and a dipping retinal venule and arteriole. And we can also see a halo of depigmented RPE around the lesion. Here also, we can see it nicely. This is the lesion. And you can see the, deep, the dipping arteriole and venule and the pigment over its surface. So here are some examples. This is an 80-year-old male with bilateral consecutive uh, de novo RCN. So this is the fundus photo of the left eye, which shows a subfoveal RCN with subretinal hemorrhage. And we can see whole of here, here also the retinal venous congestion. And this is the corresponding OCT, which shows the subretinal neovascularization. And this is the early fluorescent angiograph, which shows hypofluorescence due to blockage by the subretinal hemorrhage with late leakage of the RCN lesion. So this patient underwent partiplanar vitrectomy and subretinal injection of tissue plasminogen activator. And one year after the vitrectomy, this is the fundus photo, which shows involution of the RCN into a subfoveal fibrotic nodule. You can see also a tiny pigmentation at the bank, retinal arteriole and venule. And also note that the retinal venous congestion that was there is not anymore. So this is the FA, shows staining of the fibrotic nodule. And this is the OCT, which shows compact hyperreflective lesions surrounded by macular skis. This is the right fundus of the same patient. At the presentation, we have just only discrete macular skis with no retinal choroidal neovascularization. Three years later, the patient presented with decreased burden. And the fundus photo, and the fundus photo shows de novo RCN lesion in the central macula with subretinal hemorrhage, which is evident on OCT. So another example is a two-year-old girl with bilateral consecutive R RCN. So this is the fundus photo of her left eye, which shows an executive RC lesion at the infranasal macula with some retinal venous congestion. And the lesion is showing dilation of fluorescein angiography. So one year later, the RCN has transformed into a subretinal fibrotic nodule with dipping retinal arteriole and venule. And the retin retinal venous congestion had decreased. So also note here, 
another de novo RCN with subretinal hemorrhage also seen at the infratemporal border of the market before, and also it's leaking on fluorescein angiography. This is the right on this photo of the same patient, which shows fibrotic nodule with staining on FA and transmission defect around the fibrotic nodule. This is another example of de novo RCN evolved into a fibrosed RCN in a 10-year-old male. This is the fundus photo and the corresponding OCT which shows macular cases and no RCN. And three years later, the fluorescein angiography shows a de novo RCN as a juxtaphobia leaking lesion, which you can see it clearly on OCT. This patient re received uh, intravitreal vivacimab injection in this eye. And after six months, presented with this picture, the RCN has bloated and it becomes a unifocal fibrotic nodule. We can see it as compact hyperreflective lesion OCT. So another important and frequent feature in our population is the subretinal fibrosis. So subretinal fibrosis is part of the enhanced ISKCON syndrome phenotypic spectrum. It strongly suggests the diagnosis of enhanced ISKCON syndrome. We have observed it in 46.5% of our enhanced ISKCON syndrome patients. And recognition of this fibrosis patterns, these fibrosis patterns can spare patients unnecessary workup for inflammatory causes. So these fibrosis patterns are very important and can spare patients unnecessary workup. We have six patterns ranging from unifocal nodule to extensive fibrosis. They usually affect the macula, and sometimes in few cases we see extramacular fibrosis. Combination of patterns exists in some eyes, and it's usually fairly symmetrical in a given patient. And retinochoroidal neovascularization may be the primary cause of the unifocal central fibrotic nodule pattern. So we'll talk about the patterns of submacular fibrosis and enhanced ISKCON syndrome. The first pattern is the central unifocal nodular fibrosis. It's a solitary fibrotic nodule located towards the central macula associated with pigmentation, dipping retinal vessels, and a halo of the depigmented RPE and macular cases of variable height. You can see here the fibrotic nodule with depigmented RPE halo I can see it on, on this autofluorescence. Uh, the pink retinal artery and venule and the superficial pigmentation. Other examples, this is the unifocal nodular fibrosis in the right eye. These are the, this is the right and the, these are the right. This is the fibrotic nodule in the right on this photo with depigmented halo. And this is the left on this photo with unifocal fibrotic nodule and dipping retinal artery and venule with depigmented halo, depigmented RPE halo around the fibrotic nodule. Also, this is another unifocal central uh, nodular fibrosis, which shows also dipping retinal vessels and a depigmented RPE halo and also it's clear on OCT. And also here we, you can note the pigmentary, the pickle and classic pigmentary changes of enhanced ISKCON syndrome along the vascular arcades and macular schizes. So another important and peculiar on this feature and pattern of sub, uh, submacular and pattern of retinal fibrosis is the subvascular nodular fibrosis. It is a juxtapapillary subvascular nodule and maybe the only manifestation of enhanced ISKCON syndrome in, in children. So we can see here the juxtapapillary subvascular nodule and here also. This can be the only clue in enhanced ISKCON syndrome in, in children. So the third pattern of submacular fibrosis is the circumferential, is the multifocal nodular fibrosis. It's circumferential distribution at the macular border also, it has halo of RPE atrophy with associated pigment deposits and can be small and close proximity to each other 
like beaded chain, as we can see here, the beaded chain pattern of fibrosis, and sometimes can be large and batchy, as we can see here, also surrounded by hypopigmented RPE halo. And also here you can see the yellow white dots in nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head, and here also. And they can have macular schizes of variable height. So these are other examples of multifocal nodular fibrosis, also surrounded by halo of RPE depigmentation. And when the nodules are larger, they are coalescing into continuous arcuate fibrosis, as we can see here. Also here, note the yellow white dots, nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head. So another subretinal fibrosis pattern is the thick arcuate fibrosis. They are thick, sharply demarcated arcuate fibrotic lesions, usually at the macular boundaries, either inside the vascular arcades or along the temporal macular border. And they are associated with deep and superficial pigmentations and a halo of depigmented RPE. And sometimes they have schizes, as, which is small foveal schizes. So this is the fundus photo of one patient, shows the arcuate or fibrosis, thick arcuate fibrosis along the temporal macular border with associated deep and superficial pigmentation and the clear halo of depigmented RPE. Also, we can see other features of enhanced Scon syndrome. You can see macular schizes. You can see here the torpedo-like lesions, three torpedo-like lesions, and the yellow white dot nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head and the peculiar subvascular nodule. So these are other examples of thick arcuate fibrosis. Here we can see the thick arcuate fibrosis with the pigmented halo, which shows transmission defect in FA. And note here the pigmentary, the typical classic pigmentary changes of enhanced Scon syndrome along the vascular arcades. These two photos also show thick arcuate fibrosis with clear halo of depigmented RPE and the associated pigmentation. Also, this picture shows the thick arcuate fibrosis and the other features of enhanced Scon syndrome, like the schizes, the comets, and the yellow white dots. Another pattern of submacular fibrosis is a thick helicoid fibrosis. This pattern shared the features of arcuate fibrosis, but displayed a helicoidal extension of the fibrosis nasally towards or sometimes around the optic nerve head. So this is the helicoid pattern of fibrosis on this, on this photo. And these two photos are from the same patient, the right and left eye shows the helicoid extension around the optic nerve head. So the last pattern fibrosis is a thick, arc thick geographic fibrosis, has same characteristics as arcuate fibrosis, but much broader, much broader and more centrally located within the macula, and it sometimes extends beyond the vascular arcades. So we can see here the geographic pattern of fibrosis in the central macula, and it shares the same characteristic features with a halo of RPET pigmentation and also some deep and superficial pigmentation. So this is another example of the geographic fibrosis, the right and left from the photos of the same patient. We can see here the, the central ge thick geographic fibrosis. And also we can see other features like the temporal peripheral retinal species with demarcated RPE hyperpigmentation. And also we can see here a subvascular nodule. This is in the right eye. And in the left eye, we can see also the thick geographic fibrosis in the central macula, and also peripheral retinal schizes with demarcated RPE hyperpigmentation. And also here along the superior temporal arcade, we can see the classic typical pigmentary namular deep changes of enhanced Scon syndrome. So the genotype-phenotype correlations, 
none of the NR2E3 variants were specific for a particular pattern of fibrosis or any of the background enhanced skull syndrome features. And fibrosis is not always present in other affected family members. And we have seen phenotypic variability, which exists among individuals sharing the same homozygous mutation, whether they belong to the same or different families. So if you are interested in further reading on this topic, I encourage you to read about, well, on, to read about, to read our recent uh, publication about this topic. So in conclusion, enhanced is is an autosomal recessive retinal dystrophy caused by mutations in R2E3. It has pathognomonic ERG, so highly suggestive features which should raise the suspicion for the diagnosis include night blindness, hyperobia, nominal deep pigmentary clumps around the vascular arcades, yellow white dots, usually nasal and infranasal to the optic nerve head, torpedo-like lesions in the mid periphery, and the comets lesions, inferior, uh, inferior nasal and inferior to the optic nerve head and also at the macular border, and also the submacular fibrosis, and the subvascular nodule is a hint when you see it in children, and the retinal choroid and neovascularization, and lastly, the macular with or without peripheral species. Thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Salama, for this comprehensive review and all the um, beautiful pictures and the informative data about the patterns of uh, subretinal fibrosis and uh, retinal choroid and neovascularization. Um, I now open the floor for um, any questions. Please um, either share it through the chat and I'm happy to read it up, or you can uh, directly just uh, um, ask a question. Um, I don't think that anybody is muted. You can just unmute yourself and, and uh, ask. So uh, Dr. Amani Al-Bakri, uh, she said, thank you, Dr. Abrar, for a great presentation. Dr. Najla Ntairi also uh, thanked Dr. Abrar. Um, thank I you. Have... Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Baba. Uh, I have a question uh, about the, the case where uh, submacular hemorrhage was uh, treated by uh, a partial plane of vitrectomy and TPA. Uh, do you feel like, uh, you know, there is some sort of like um, criteria for patients where you would go for surgery rather than just do conservative uh, treatment by just like doing intravitreal anti-VGF injections? What was removal of hemorrhage crucial for uh, for the fibrosis or improvement of vision, or do you think this is something that we should consider in other patients as well? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Baghdad, for the nice question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Actually, the, in the literature, when you see the literature, there are no much studies about uh, intervention for treatment of retinal choroid and neovascularization, or some they call choroid and neovascularization, or uh, also subretinal neovascularization. So uh, for, for this patient, uh, the PPV was done before the patient was diagnosed with, with enhanced scone syndromes. The patient presented to the uh, surgical retina and they did the, um, uh, the, the partial planet vitrectomy. And then later when the genetic testing came, it uh, shows the NR2E3 mutation. Uh, for the intravitreal anti vegf injection, we don't have much experience. Among our series, we have only three patients received intravitreal anti vegf injection. One of them uh, is this one. So also this patient so shows unifocal pancreatic nodule similar to the one post parsiblana vitrectomy. And the other two patients, they received, um, they are siblings, they received the intravitreal anti vegf injection outside in another uh, center and, and another, another institution in USA. When they presented to us, they presented with the typical unifocal fibrotic nodule. So I don't think that, although we have limited data, I don't think that treatment of uh, these uh, RC allegiance will end the, the outcome. 
they will end up with unifocal fibrotic nodules, whether you treat or not. Um, totally agree with you, but would you think that, um, say, for example, I'm, I'm taking, for example, say, patients with uh, with best disease, and sometimes, you know, during the vitelli eruptive stage, for example, they develop also choroidal vascularization, and, uh, you know, currently the, there are few centers in the world, including ours, actually. If we uh, see that the patient has got an active choroidal vascularization, we go ahead and treat with anti-VGF. So do you think this is something that would alter at least the outcome in, in a sense that, you know, the visual outcome would be better rather than just observing and just leaving the patient alone? Yeah, you know what, to, to answer this question, we need to, to do, uh, uh, to compare the patients who receive intravitreal injection and the patients who, who, are, who don't. Hmm. One patient comes to me with active RC and lesion, I will give them the chance of intravitreal bevacizumab injection or any anti injection. If it is active hmm. lesion with subretinal hemorrhage and exudation. No, I totally agree with you. Margins on OCT. Yeah, I totally agree with you because this might also, as, as you said, we don't have any, you know, comparative data and it's, it's really difficult to have such data because if you have an active membrane, you, you can't really, you know, ethically just leave the patient without any intervention just to see whether, you know, the vision is going to be different from another patient who, who had an intervention, for example. It's, it's really difficult to control for that. Um, so uh, I, I, I really kind of, uh, it made me think when, when you were talking, I mean, you, you mentioned in, in the beginning of the presentation and, and for all the audience, please interrupt me because I can't talk forever about, you know, these disorders because it's, uh, it's really fascinating. Um, uh, the, the, it's a transcription factor. So I'm, I'm sure that you covered quite a lot of, of the literature more than I can ever cover in, in this particular aspect about, you know, retinochoroid and revascularization. Any particular reason pathophysiologically, because you said they, they resemble the, the RAP lesions. And uh, <coughs> when you mentioned something about the, you know, dipping venule or something like that, or my brain was actually telling me dipping venule, and it's just like kind of clicked with the choroidal vascularization that you see sometimes in patients with juxta uh, foveal telangiectasia, for example. Mm -hmm. Anything in common at all? Um, do you think what, what's happening in, in the retina that induces the choroidal vascularization in those patients, even those who are incredibly young, you know, at the time when the retina has just recently developed, so to say? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Babad, for that interesting question. Yeah, I have looked into this and uh, the reason, the mechanism of of the uh, behind the RC and lesions, uh, specifically enhanced Stone syndrome. I did not find uh, any explanation for, for this. Still, it requires further studies. So no, no clear explanation why this happens. But I, what I can tell is that the unifocal fibrotic nodule from what we noticed in our series, that the origin of the unifocal uh, fibrotic nodule is the RCN. So there was a question before, if, is the fibrosis a precursor of the RCN or the uh, uh, RCN is a consequence of the fibrosis? So what we can conclude from what we observe in our series is that the RCN may be the origin of the unifocal fibrotic nodule, but what's the pathophysiology and the mechanism uh, of this, it's, it's uh, unclear yet. Okay, that's really great. I, I'm just reading out loud a question from Dr. Marco uh, Robio. I'm, I'm sorry, probably I, I was reading your mind, Dr. Robio. He said, thanks, Dr. Abrar. Uh, anything to comment on to anti with you, which you have given a very beautiful answer to? And uh, the second question was, do they respond like classic CNV or more like la RAP lesions? So this part... Um, could you please comment about so that? The, 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 uh, the end result, the unifocal fibrotic nodule, the RCN lesion, when, when it's involute and end up with a fibrotic nodule, they share similar features of the RAP lesion more than the classic CMD. They have the dipping uh, retinal vessels, they have superficial pigmentation. It's more of, of the attack between new vascularization, the RAP lesion, rather than the classic uh, CMD. What, what I Okay, that's really great. Um, any other uh, questions? Yes, from the yes, yes. yes. Go uh, ahead. I'm Salsa Noelati. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, first of all, 
thank you, Dr. Salam Salama, for a beautiful presentation uh, on something that is very precious to both of us. I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you've, uh, and I would like to congratulate you on this. Um, the, um, the question about the RAP lesion and what you mentioned, Dr. Babat, that is very similar to what's happening in gypsophobias and injectasia. Absolutely. Uh, they look very, very similar. They behave similarly. And when you give um, anti vagif injections, um, basically they involute, but when they involute, they look exactly like the um, unifocal nodule fibrosis, you know, that uh, uh, Dr. Abrar mentioned and, and showed. So they tend whether treated or untreated with uh, anti vagif And again, uh, in our series, we have, as she mentioned, the three cases that have been treated with anti vegf uh, that, uh, that evolved into this, um, uh, this nodular fibrosis. But the literature also shows uh, several cases since the past 20 years of uh, uh, these, you know, CM CNVs or, or subretinal neovascularizations that also uh, end up looking this, like this fibrotic nodule. And some of them have had anti vegf treatment and they end up looking the same. So the, to answer the question, do they, do they look the same or does the anti vegf alter anything? Who knows? They look the same. The, the, the time of, to, to, of, of involution remains to be known, uh, to, be, to, be, to be evaluated. But, but, but your question, Dr. Babad, about whether there is any something particular that happens uh, that causes these RCNs to develop. Let me tell you that from in all in our series and in every single uh, case report or short series report in the literature that have mentioned uh, subretinal fibrosis or the RCN as they as they behave as they as they occur with the blood, subretinal blood and and sometimes exudation, uh, they have always been in the central part of the macula. We only have one single case, a two, a two year old. I may, I may be wrong. Ebrard, you may want to correct me maybe a four-year-old, I don't know, but it's a very, very young yeah. child who developed an RCN. One single case. Well, as Every single case that we've had in our series, the, there's something about the anatomy. Lightning idea. I was uh, thinking that, uh, and more, more interestingly, also like patients with biallelic mutations, not the heterozygous, the biallelic mutations in and another transcription factor that is just ahead of NR2E3 in the um, in the scheme of things, sort of say, saying like so. So basically, we start off by certain transcription factors that actually switch the phenotype of, of the photoreceptors from the cones, it tells the retina, okay, we've got enough cones, let's make some rods. And ahead of NR2A3, there is another gene that's called yes. NRL. And uh, there, there are very few uh, uh, reports in the literature and the phenotype exactly looks like enhanced Absolutely. syndrome, which makes perfect sense. Albeit, I don't think that the choroidal, retinochoroidal new vascularization is a prominent feature, or maybe there aren't enough cases to actually to describe that in NRL patients. But the bottom line is that <clears throat> the first wave of differentiation of photoreceptors actually happens in the macula, because we share with, with, uh, with mammals the, something that we call the visual streak. So the visual streak is actually a, a high cone density region in the retina. And because we developed a macula, we still have something similar to the other mammals like cats and, and uh, you know, and, um, and, and tigers and everything else that actually horizontally, we have the high cone density in the macula and also horizontally, uh, temporally and nasally. So the, the number of cones is much higher there. So I, and, and then the first wave of differentiation of photoreceptors happens at the macula before the photoreceptors, even, you know, the, the cuboidal tiny, you know, nascent photoreceptors decide to differentiate in the peripheral retina. So everything happens, all the magic, all the differentiation happens in the macula first, and then everything else, uh, you know, uh, follows. So it makes perfect sense because one of the you know prominent lesions that you see sometimes in those patients is something that resembles the rosettes 
you know, yes. they are immature contraceptors that never managed to actually differentiate fully. And, and the, the term rosette has been actually coined similar to what people see in patients with retinoblastoma. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this might induce a wave of degeneration within the macula because you have so many photoreceptors, the, uh, the blood supply isn't sufficient from the outer retina to support that many photoreceptors and they haven't differentiated to become rods. Mm -hmm. And uh, wh what I think might be happening is basically you have this kind of cell death because of some sort of, <clears throat> okay, we don't need that many of you guys. And then probably that may induce a little bit of inflammatory response as cell death does. And uh, probably that may induce the fibrosis. I mean, who knows? But uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. Thank you. It is, it is also interesting uh, for, for everybody to know that the fibrosis happens very, very early on in, um, in life. Uh, we've seen it in, in people as young as one and two years. And um, it doesn't change much. So it yeah. seems like once you have it, that's it. Unless, yeah. you know, along the line, somewhere, somewhere, uh, you know, the patient develops a retinochoroidal nevascularization in the center. Then that induces another little focus of, of fibrosis. But uh, once the fibrosis has established itself, it doesn't really change much. It's, it's a uh, developmental disease more than anything yes. else. It's, it's, yes. it's not a degenerative disorder as, as we see other disorders like retinitis pigmentosa and other, you know, related. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the, the retina actually is pushed towards, you know, um, you know, a, a problem that happened right from the beginning, the retina did not develop completely, and therefore exactly. we are dealing with the sequelae. And, and that's why I'm just really surprised that, you know, the group in, in New York are, are, are talking about some sort of gene therapy for enhanced Escon syndrome. How can you reverse something that happened developmentally, that certain, you know, certain conditions have to be met for the retina to make rods, and that never happens in those patients. Right, right. Interest, interesting thought, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Badbad and Dr. Noelati, for the valuable comments. Very interesting discussion. Yeah, you brought it up. I mean, you 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 presented beautiful images and beautiful insights, and that only makes us all, you know, think and wonder. So I always like, you know, presentations that make us, you know, go outside and scratch our heads trying to find, you know questions and find new answers for them. So thank you ever so much for that. Uh, if I may add, uh, Dr. Babad and Dr. Salam, I, I know that Abrar mentioned it, but I think for the audience and for the people who don't work at Kekesh and who see these cases, because we do have a lot of cases of NR2E3 uh, related uh, dystrophies, such as the enhanced Escon syndrome and Goldman Father in our population. And it is often mistaken either for retinitis pigmentosa, but of course in retinitis pigmentosa you have uh, you know, different, you have a phenotype, you have the bone spicules, you have the, or bone, bone-like spicules, as you like to call it, the chloropath, and uh, the attenuated vessels, and, you know, the power of the optic nerve, and so forth, um, so they don't really look the same, and in a syndrome, you've got the grainy RPE changes on the macula, and then you've got the lump, the clumps of RPE, uh, uh, around the macula as well, which could be subtle and could be sometimes, you know, they're not so subtle, they're big as, as Dr. Abrar has shown. So, but, but the bottom line is that the, one of the reasons I think uh, Dr. Salama presented this is also to, to emphasize two things. And those are to be emphasized to people who don't work in academic institutions. This is not RP. It doesn't behave like RP. It doesn't get worse like RP. The only thing that can get worse is the skeezies that may get worse. And in this case, the vision will decrease, not because of the degeneration itself, but because of the skeezies that may in, you know, get bigger and cause less uh, you know, central vision. And the other thing is, is that when people see the fibrotic changes, the mind always goes to inflammation. And we've seen patients that have had a treatment, uh, immunosuppressive treatment because of the fibrotic changes, okay? So please, when you see fibrosis such as this, such as the ones that were described, the ones with the pigmentary changes on top and the one with the RPE halo around them, uh, this, uh, think of enhanced Escon syndrome and try to ask if the patient has as a night blindness, and if indeed yes, then do an ERG if possible, okay, or get a genetic test. Um, this is very important because you don't you want to spare people uh, the you know uh, extensive workup and eventually uh, anti-inflammatory treatment or immunosuppressive treatment. 
I, that I was totally, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, the most two uh, patients who actually arrived to the retina clinic, um, you know, after being transferred from the uveitis team, I mean, and this also happened internationally. So yes. we had patients with enhanced Escon syndrome treated, as you just mentioned, and also patients with CRB1 uh, retinopathy mm -hmm. because the retina is so messed up and disorganized and also macular edema is a common those mm -hmm. patients. Who, Yes. So, you know, just be on the lookout. And, and uh, you know, despite that the DRG is pathognomonic, I mean, I think the, the distinction, the, the, the border between enhanced Escon syndrome and Goldman Favre is quite, you know, like a spectrum. Goldman Favre. And funny enough, actually, at some stage, the definition of Goldman Favre was actually undetectable ERG. Yes. So yes. if you happen to have uh, traces, just go ahead and, and test, you know, do ge genetic testing and spare the patient the agony of being immunosuppressed for no good reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, the ERG is pathognomonic, you know, when there, when there are still retinal function, but when the function is, is very reduced, everything becomes very you know, non, almost non-recordable, so it doesn't, it, it doesn't help you much. But one thing that is also important to notice uh, is that uh, people with uh, enhanced Escon syndrome and of course Goldman Fab have vitreous changes. And those vitreous changes can be very obvious and it can almost look like a vitritis. And we've seen patients that have had intravitreal injections of steroids or subtenone injections of steroids because they were thought to have, you know, uveitis, vitritis, all right? So again, either they're given immunosuppressive therapy or they're given, you know, uh, uh, inappropriate intravitreal therapy for, for inflammation where there is no inflammation whatsoever. And I think right now, um, when people uh, um, examine these cases with uh, the sweat source OCT, they find much, much more uh, vitreous changes that, than what meets the eye, than what we have recognized before. So this is something to keep in mind as well. Thank you very much. I'm just going to check the, uh, the chat for any further comments. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Nolati, mashallah, um, and Dr. Abrar have already given quite um, uh, informative, you know, uh, background about this disorder that, you know, our colleagues outside of KCASH will find it hopefully uh, quite helpful in, in suggesting the diagnosis and directing the patient to, uh, to the right um, management. Um, if there are no more questions or comments, uh, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for, for your attention and for your time. And uh, we look forward to meeting you next week during our activity. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ba uh, Al Salama Abrar. A wonderful job. And congratulations to all your hard work, uh, to you, actually, for all your hard work on the subject and uh, I echo what Dr. Uh, Bab Bad uh, has mentioned um, that is to, to review the, 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 your, your talk but also the publications that recently came out in, in ophthalmology retina and in the AJO uh, that talk about the subject. Thank you very much and, uh, Lati, and I appreciate your presence in spite you are on leave. Thank you very much. I had to come Dr. Al Salama. <laughs> you're, you're so dear to me. I had to come and, and uh, and I really enjoyed it very, very much. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Abad, for your thoughtful uh, uh, questions, uh, which we're going to try to tackle next time. It's very valuable. And thanks for all that. Thank you. For Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.